So I, I think the first thing I, I want to say is that climate change is the biggest challenge our civilization has ever had to face up to. <coughs> and we had a meeting, finally, having begun in 1992 with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, we had a meeting in 2015 in which we got global agreement on managing this problem. 2015, eight years later, how well are we doing? I have a bunch of slides, if my PowerPoint could come up, and maybe I could move over to the podium. Yeah, I can, and I use the, see it then. the device should be there. So I, I think what I want to do on the first slide is, is just tell you what, what we have been doing. Uh, and I'm taking us ba right back to the year 1700, pre the Industrial Revolution, and I think you can clearly see Greenhouse gases have been rising inexorably, right? And if you, can, if you can find 2015 on that curve, you'd be doing pretty well because there's no change really in 2015. So what, what we are doing at the moment is destroying our climate system. And I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the results of this. We've heard from uh, Nicolas Takias, the extreme, extreme weather events in Greece last year. Extreme, extreme weather events are now happening all over the world. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to try and explain to you what the Climate Crisis Advisory Group that I chair, by the way, it's a global group, uh, 17 people from 12 countries, and they're all climate science leaders. So what, what we, we have analyzed and we publish our reports in real time, we've been analyzing what is happening and what needs to be done. So I, in the first instance, of course, I, I think what I've got to say doesn't sound very promising, uh, to say the least, uh, but then I will set out what the strategy has to be and what we all need to do. Um, so let me just look at, uh, well, so the first slide, yep. First slide shows temperature, sorry, the greenhouse gas rise. We've known the impact of greenhouse gases since two, sorry, since, uh, let me get it right, 1824, when the great French scientist Fourier first calculated it. Right, so this isn't a new factor, it was predicted way back here, and here we are marching forward, uh, unknown to, to the world is this, uh, this effect. So let me take you then. This is, remember the first slide is the greenhouse gas levels rising. And you see they really take off at about this point here. The next slide shows the temperature measurements, global temperature measurements, going back to 1880, the date that I just mentioned. And you can see this, this zero point here is just the average over this timeline here. Uh, but what you can see is the temperature has been rising uh, year on year to, to the present time. Now, I say it's been rising year on year. Uh, this last year has been a big challenge to all of us. 2023, uh, the average global temperature rise above the pre-industrial level was not 1.2 or 1.3 degrees centigrade, it was 1.44 degrees centigrade. And if I, if you then, just to keep you in this frame of mind, what was the average temperature rise for the whole global planet in uh, uh, February this year? We've now got the official figures in 1.77. So it, it's, it's looking much scarier than we thought it was just uh, uh, last year. And of course, these extreme weather events go back over the last five years. I mean, extreme, extreme weather events. So let me take you uh, to, uh, I'll stay with this slide, please. No? Thank you. I didn't point this out. There's an added problem that we haven't been fully watching, which is what is happening to the distribution of temperature rise around the whole planet? And what you can see as we move forward in time is that the Arctic Circle region has been heating up much more quickly than the average for the whole planet. In fact, it's now heating up 
at four times the rate of the rest of the planet. And that's actually the average over quite a long period of time, the last 10, 15 years. So let me take you to the next slide, which just emphasizes this. So this is the, in gray, the average temperature rise for the whole planet. And in red, you see the temperature rise for the Arctic Circle region. Now I'm going to explain to you why what's happening in the Arctic Circle region doesn't stay there. It impacts on the climate system of the whole world. Right, so let me take you, try and take you through that in a very short space of time. The next slide <coughs> shows you a very important factor. So what, what you see up here is the Arctic Circle region. It's a big part of the planet. Uh, and it has a very strong wind going anti-clockwise around the North Pole, driven by the rotation of the planet. Why this gives us our day, night time. So this wind here keeps the warm air in the tropical region away from the cold air in the North, uh, north region around the North Pole. And of course, it means that this is an essential part of the global climate system because what happens now when we get a warm Arctic? And how warm is the Arctic? One of the members of my group back in 2021 was a man who lives on the uh, permafrost up in the north of Finland. And I was chatting to him on the phone at the end of April 2021. What's the temperature? He said, it's bloody cold. It's about minus 32. What would it normally be? Minus 10, minus 15. And they're used to living at that. I spoke to him at the end of July the same year, less than three months later, the local temperature in the air, two meters above the permafrost, was plus 32. Um, 60 degrees centigrade temperature rise in a very short space of time. So what's happened there is that the warm air that is formed over the Arctic Sea, that blue sea soaks up sunshine and above the blue sea, the air warms up very quickly. But previously, that was all covered with ice. We've been losing ice. That's the driving factor here. And that blue sea soaking up the sunlight is causing this warm air stream to flow over regions of permafrost. And it just happened that the wind was blowing towards my colleague on the, uh, in the north of Finland. So all I want to emphasize here is if the warm air up here creates a draft of warm air down, it'll push the cold air down further. Right, so we get this massive distortion in that very important jet stream, the strong wind. Now, what happens, of course, if air's coming blowing down here, it'll have to be replaced by hot air from the tropics. And so there's your, your big problem. And the next slide is not just for demonstrative purposes. The next slide shows, I mean this slide, don't move it. This slide shows what actually happened in the summer of 2021 uh, with Lytton in British Columbia experiencing a temperature of 49.6 degrees centigrade for two weeks. Now what happened there was that this jet stream got locked in. So this is the cold air coming down here, cold air coming down central North America but very hot air coming from the tropics up here. And Lytton in British Columbia experienced these very high temperatures. 143 people in this upper middle class town died of heat stress. You cannot live at these temperatures. And then the whole town burnt down as the local forest caught fire. This is happening in our world today and throughout the world. That uh, incidence in, in northern Greece the floods, when a very large agricultural area was wiped out by the floods, was preceded by the biggest forest fire in Europe on record, in northern Greece up against the Turkish border. So what we're seeing is these extreme weather events driven by what I'm saying is happening in the Arctic Circle region. So let me then just move on <coughs> as quickly as I can. Let me summarize the things that are happening in the Arctic Circle. First of all, we've got Greenland. 
Now, this blue sea in the Arctic during the three polar summer months causes a warming of this ice. The ice, as we know, is it looks like irreversibly melting. <laughs> There's enough ice on here that w because it has to enter the sea, unlike sea ice, which is already there, it will give rise to global sea levels rising by 7.5 meters, 24 feet. Global average sea level temperature, uh, sea level rise. Here's the polar, th this is the jet stream effect that I just described, causing these extreme weather events. And on the left hand side here, that permafrost contains a vast amount of methane trapped as methane hydrate. And when that warms up, we get explosive release now. This has been happening since 2014. Explosive release of methane and carbon dioxide. Methane is 110 times more effective as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And there's enough there that if it was all emitted within 10 to 20 years, global temperatures will rise by 5 to 8 degrees centigrade. Now, with these sorts of levels of temperature rise and sea level rise, you can see that no matter how hard we try to adapt, we're not going to manage these challenges. And of course, then the question is going to be, and what is the timeline? I have the next slide. Now, this is a piece of work I'm very pleased with because I've been trying to move the calculation of loss and damage away from the economists, pardon all of you, uh, to the sector that is m closest to this of all, which is the insurance and reinsurance sector. They know how to calculate loss and damage. And here are the latest results. Now, you may say it's unsatisfactory because you see three different graphs. Loss and damage plotted as a function of temperature rise. And remember, I've just told you this is where we are now with temperature rise, but it's rapidly going up. <coughs> loss and damage globally, at the moment, probably about quarter to half a trillion dollars a year for the whole planet, but rising, and you'll see, to 100% of GDP. That's this top line here is 100% of GDP. Uh, and the timeline isn't included here. What is just included is the temperature rise. But certainly, we're looking at 2070 being the time when the global system will be dysfunctional as a result of this massive cost of loss and damage. It will not be restricted to past behavior. The big feedback effects that are happening will take us into much, much more dangerous territory. Let me give you one example. 2050, we're pretty confident that the country of Vietnam, which is very close to sea level, the country of Vietnam will be 85% under seawater at least once a year, the country. Now, we, we know that it's the third biggest rice producer in the world. First and second biggest rice producers are China and Indonesia. Oh, and most of their paddy fields are also very close to sea level. So what you're looking at is one of the positive feedbacks which causes this negative outcome, which is you lose that amount of rice and you have a global crisis. You create that amount of flooding and you have a big migratory crisis. So what, what we're looking to is a series of events that we're not really focusing on. So I take you to the next slide, which uh, hopefully is my last. This is, this is the strategy that the Climate Crisis Advisory Group has put out. And it is a strategy that is not easy to follow in detail. So I'm just going to give it to you very quickly because I know Joan's in a hurry. <laughs> so first of all, we have to reduce emissions deeply and rapidly, and let me say it, 2050, too late. All right, so we really have to bring forward that date when we have reduced our emissions, and I'm talking about absolute emissions, by 85 to 90%. I would like to see that happening by 2035. But remember, as we keep adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, the situation I've described only gets worse and worse. So, secondly, too much greenhouse gases up there already. No, we don't have a budget. 
left to put greenhouse gases up there. Every single ton of greenhouse gases we continue to put up there will have to be removed to create a manageable future for humanity beyond the year 2080 or thereabouts. Right, so what, what we're saying is we have to find methods of removing excess greenhouse gases not to get to net zero, but to get way beyond net zero. We are currently, if I can give you this figure, it may not mean too much, we're cur currently well over 500 parts per million of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, pre-industrially 275. So we have almost doubled the amount of greenhouse gases. Safe level for the future, 350. Massive challenge to bring it down. We need to buy time to do that. So many people are a bit skeptical about this when I said we are now doing experiments to see how we can refreeze the Arctic Circle region. If we could stop that ice that forms over the Arctic Sea still in the winter, if we could stop it melting in the summer, then we can go forward uh, in, a, in a way to the end of the century with these first two challenges. And then let me come to resilience. Resilience is my last point, but it's a critically important point. So you know that Hurricane Sandy hit the city of New York in 2012. Now we've put out reports on how different cities have responded to these challenges. We've been into the mayor's office in, uh, in New York. <coughs> and the city of New York decided to bring in the US Army Corps of Engineers, a brilliant group of civil engineers, to give them a plan. And the plan was put forward four years later, an enormous plan, which essentially was to build a wall around the city of New York, which would be between eight foot and 24 foot high, two and a half meters to four meters high, and the city rejected the plan because nobody wants a, a big wall around the city. So when we talked to the people in the mayor's office, they said they're still discussing alternatives. Now I'm going to say there is no alternative. Right? So what is happening in Shanghai? And there I'm wrapping up with the best example on preparedness because in Shanghai, they now already have the world's biggest water pumps to pump any seawater out of the city of Shanghai when it does come. They have a, a policy of no regrets. So instead of building a wall and telling the people it's got to be so many meters high, they're building foundations. And then you can later on build the wall as high as is necessary. So this no regrets type of policy. What I'm interested here in is how can we exchange best practice from one part of the world to another. I very much appreciate the discussion that preceded this and especially listening to, to all of those speakers on the preparedness that they have for this energy transition. But I do want to put a bullet under all of them. You need to move much more quickly. Thank you.